Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marcus Hearn and the Omni Market Customer Panel. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, the Omni Market Customer Panel probably takes a little explaining. It's a term you've not heard yet, I think, in the last two days. But it's pretty straightforward. So my name is Marcus Hearn. I'll introduce our panelists in a minute. I've worked at SDL for about 18 months. My previous lives were at a company called IBM, you might have heard of, and another one called TCS, you might not have heard of. Both actually quite large organizations, both close to 400,000 employees, um, revenues up in the 11 figures each. And I've been working in marketing in those organizations. And you would think with the resources we had, we would have been able to get all of our content into all of our markets immediately. I had an 11 figure budget and it was not possible. We always had to prioritize. I learned a phrase that I'll never forget called figs J. And that was French, Italian, German, Spanish, and Japanese. And I had to do those and then everything else was a fight. Everything else was prioritization. It was sales demanding the content be localized so they could sell. It was me demanding they create demand before I localize the content. And ultimately, what we were always trying to do was reach a place where we could get all of our content ready for all of our markets upon release of a product or upon release of a campaign. We wanted to get to this place where all content was in all places for all users and all buyers immediately. And that is known as being omni-market. And what you saw yesterday with Adolfo's keynote, and as you've seen as we go through here, this state of being omni-market is what generates global understanding. And of course, Adolfo went through, OK, to get to global understanding, you then have to have intelligent content and intelligent translation. So the panel today that's joining me, I would like to discuss this being omni-market for the purposes of achieving global understanding. And allow me first to introduce them all. So to my left here is Al Lommel, Senior Analyst at CSA Research. Mimi Hills, Director of Global Information at VMware. Noel McDonough. A director of content operations at Dell, and Charles Dowdell, business solutions mm. at Edwards Life Sciences. So welcome everyone, thank you for joining me. <laughs> All right, my first question I'd like to actually start with Arl, and then move okay. on to everyone else. Given how I've explained Omnimarket here, and relating it into the global understanding, do you agree that this is something that's possible? Do you see this as a state that organizations, people like myself in a marketing organization could achieve? Um, certainly it's something that organizations should aspire to and whether or not they can achieve it depends on a lot of factors. Um, one would be you know, how many markets, how many languages are you in? It's, it's one thing to say we're gonna do it for five languages. Uh, it's another to say we're gonna do it for 20. And by the time you hit something like Google was discussing yesterday, 120, uh, it becomes quite difficult and so it's a question of resource allocation. And certainly technology, like we've been talking about with, with SDL's offerings, is absolutely vital if you're gonna do it. Because if, if you're trying to manage this um, in an ad hoc basis without a strategy, without technology to back it up, it's absolutely impossible. Um, but it's becoming increasingly more possible. Uh, so the addition of machine translation to the mix, um, improved translation management is really accelerating this. And we're going from you know, 15 years ago where organizations would have struggled to do 10 languages to achieve something like this. And in fact, they wouldn't have even been able to do what they could do today. Now you can see organizations that quite comfortably do this for 40 or 50 languages. So I think it's increasingly possible. And the other big shift we're seeing with intelligent content is, is being able to do this with customers in real time. Whereas, as if we talked about Omnimarket 10 years ago, it would have been very much a center out model of pushing content out and, and it disappears into the void and, and you don't know what's happening. And now increasingly, customers expect to have a dialogue with companies and you need the technology to support that. And it, it, it's becoming possible. Excellent, Mimi, how's your, what's your view? So I, I agree. I think that we wouldn't have our jobs if we weren't a little bit optimistic about this, at least. Uh, for me, I work on the product side specifically, and in 
enterprise software. And so I am one of the people who, in a way, is fortunate to have a limited number of languages that we start with. But after that, and as we expand and look at different product areas, different markets, super important to understand what those markets are and where we're going and where the differences are between our products and those markets and what direction that we go. But I do believe that we can get there. Excellent. Now, again, being optimistic, uh, I'm from Dell's perspective. So we play both in the client side, the consumer side, and the enterprise side. So we have different challenges there in terms of the number of languages that we need to release. So it's by product that we were probably looking at it. So from the enterprise, we have a limited set of languages. We know what languages we're going to apply to each product at the time of release. On the consumer side, we can potentially go 40 plus languages. So that presents a lot more challenges. Um, it does. But, you know, we are optimistic. We do um, release those products with those different languages and trying to keep up to speed with those is an ever evolving challenge. I can see that. And Charles. So yeah, at Edwards, um, I encourage you to go to the website, edwards.com. You'll see that uh, we're all about the patient and delivering uh, life-saving heart therapies and doing that globally. Uh, so yes, this is extremely important to us. In addition to what we've heard, I think it's also important for us to consider, or we, are, cons we, we consider, is the localization aspect, uh, not just languages. So it's, it's very important for us. Uh, but also the quality has to be absolutely right on. It has to be 100%. So as, as we have some sort of uh, speed, quality, uh, volume trade-off, uh, we're skewed a little bit, a lot of bit, towards quality, repeatability, but also with the uh, localization aspect of translation. So with that focus on quality, a um, bit of a side question, how long does it take then when you enter a new market with a new language, typically for Edwards? Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, time is of the essence of us, especially in some particular fringe cases, for example. Literally, lives could depend on it. Uh, so yeah, uh, it can't be fast enough. And so when I saw the numbers that Adolfo had yesterday, I said, oh yeah, 300 words? Yeah, uh, Weeks? Are you kidding me? <laughs> weeks. So yes, the time pressure is, is uh, really something that concerns us. Excellent. How about, I want to touch back then, Noel, you said you did 40 languages for the consumer side. Yeah. Like how quickly do you adopt new languages for that B2C effort? How does that take a while? Or do you guys have like probably less a focus on quality? You're able to get in there more quickly. Uh, well, quality is a key aspect of everything that we have to do. So uh, driving that and ensuring that we get those languages out at the right time is key and it's ever evolving. Okay, and what those languages are going to be, the markets that we're in, as we're global, we're, um, and as we start to evolve our enterprise side as well, um, you know, we, we try to be um, on time to market. We typically are. Uh, we would like to have 300 words. That would be a, a simple solution. Would but, be nice. You know, when you look at, you know, we produce somewhere in the region of 14,500 publications on a monthly basis, and then you start to apply the languages on top of that. Uh, you can start to see the complexities that get into play there. Right, you're one of the organizations that Adolfo showed that 13,000 pieces of content per year, mm -hmm. which you've easily exceeded. So you're pushing that curve up quite high. Just a little bit, yes. Just a little bit. And maybe you mentioned you used um, machine translation to help yes. you do this a bit more effectively. And with regards to quality, are you using neural machine translation or a, a more legacy version of it? And do you see that? helping or hindering with the quality sort of aspect of it all? Well, Neural MT definitely helps with the quality aspect of it and also the time to market. So when we do have those huge, huge projects that go out, we can start early with NMT. We can keep retranslating them if we need to at minimal cost just to keep up so that when they are announced, we are right there. Excellent. Yeah. Finishing then back on you, Arl. When the research spaces, you look across different customers, do these resonate? Do you see a sort of common theme out there as organizations are entering into new markets, tackling new languages? Like, how are they solving it? What do you see as sort of the majority of organizations in terms of their priority and ability to tackle and time to get into a new market? Um, well, one of the things we, we see uh, along this after looking at uh, a couple thousand um, global brands uh, quite closely 
is that there's, there is often is a prioritization as they enter a new market. You start with brand awareness content and then you move into product information. And then eventually you may get into um, support and then sort of at the very end is, is social media and, and these sorts of things. And it's a very pragmatic strategy because you, know, you, you have to have the brand awareness before you have the product information and so forth. And so there isn't one point where you can say we're fully in market, but you could be at a new market at the brand awareness side in, in some cases in a matter of a couple weeks and then slowly build from there. Um, the other thing we see is that as companies add more and more markets, they're actually translating less and less of what's there. Some of it is that over time they've just built up a large legacy body of material, but they're also looking at very pragmatically, how do we get out there and get ourselves in front of the customers and provide them what they need? And over time they realize maybe we don't need all of this. At the same time though, we do find that there's a tendency sometimes to fall, to, to, to not really think through it, and then you break the customer journey. Um, I'll use an example, I won't name the company, but we looked at one uh, large IT company had, uh, I think it was 34 languages for everything until you hit the point of sale. And the moment you go to buy on it, then you're in 12. So you've been going along in Hungarian quite happily, and then you go to pay and suddenly you're in English or German, and if you don't know these, you may just simply walk away. So it's not enough to just say we're gonna do the brand. You have to think through it in terms of the customer journey and how do we make this accessible to somebody throughout it. And that does take time. That's a good point. It's a good point actually to pivot on with regards to content. Obviously being a marketer, I'm very much the pre-sale, right? We do have focus on post-sale, but there's also the content within the product or the offering or what it may be, the technical documentation. And Really, that is all part of the customer experience. What marketing does up front, what sales does in points of engagement, through transaction to then support and so forth on onward. I just want to sort of talk about a little how important, when you think about the three things a company can excel at, product, customer service, and operations, in your world is really the customer experience. I want to start with you, Mimi, and VMware. What's, how important is that to VMware? Sure, that's really quite important. Even with the most technical documentation that might just go to admins, for example, who, people who are um, technical who are looking at the documentation and trying to figure out what they're gonna do with this new product that, that they've never worked with, the customer experience there is really critical and it's gonna take them a lot longer if it's not in their language. Often we look at the, um, the most technical material and if we think, well, we're not gonna do that manual because fewer people are looking at it. We can look at our website stats and see that fewer people are looking at it, but this is the manual they need most in their language because it's the hardest to understand. And they're either gonna be spending a lot of their time reading it or they're gonna have it in their language and have a great experience with the product because of that. All right. Very good. And Charles, just jumping over to you quickly. Sorry, no, I'll definitely come back to you. But the same sort of thing then within the uh, sort of content experience, if you will, of the customer experience post sales when they're actually utilizing the life saving technology and everything. I'm sure it's critical to you guys, almost as critical as the product itself, that it perform as expected. Like, would you say that's uh, something that Edwards really is focused on? Yeah, I think that uh, I think we're having good dialogue about that. Uh, the information is as critical as the product, uh, which is kind of, a, a, I think, a big change uh, when we look at information and information science. I think that uh, uh, that's a very important topic to have uh, because if you have the, this product, product X, information Y, obviously that's wrong. Right. So it doesn't matter which one's incorrect, right? You still don't have a successful outcome. Right. So it's super important to make sure you just don't say it's the information. Well, it's equally the product. And I think it's important to have that dialogue. So the challenge there is you, two, you have to, those two pillars, you have to focus on them very heavily. Yes. And I know Adele, I think you're renowned, and correct me if this has changed, but you guys are operationally excellent, right? The supply chain you have enables you to reach the margins and the markets you do. But therein, do you have a sort of balance as well with the user experience? Like, is that as important, do you find, as the same conversation going on that one without the other doesn't matter? 
Yeah, user experience is something that drives us, I think, on a daily basis, uh, much like Mimi, like from the technical documentation standpoint. So it's not just the user experience, but it's also the, the journey, customer journey and where they are within the product set and who that audience is within that journey. So as Mimi indicated, like an administrator may need certain type of documentation in certain languages, whereas the service person might need a whole different set of documentation. So we have to evaluate those aspects and look at where they fit and then determine what's the appropriate delivery mechanism that we need to provide for those and then the languages associated with those as well. Right, of course. And summing it up then, Arl, in your experience at the analyst level, like across those three things, the customer experience, the product excellence, or the operational efficiency, where do you sort of see this uh, user experience, customer experience sort of sitting in terms of priority or importance, if you will, across the three these days? So there's the question of what is and what should be, and, and they're often very different. And what we see is that local enter, enterprise localization groups are often very focused on operational concerns. Uh, thinking back to the last discussion, they're, they're very inward focused. Um, when they need to be taking the customer journey and customer experience in, but they, they often, uh, they're often isolated from it operationally. They're siloed off and they're just, people just throw stuff at them and say, you know, put this into Chinese. Whereas if, if we can start breaking down these walls and ask what does the customer experience need to be in Chinese or Japanese, and actually looking at the localization groups as a resource to that you can see dramatic improvements. So I think it needs to be a much higher priority than it typically is. Well, it's interesting, because then I think one of the questions comes into play, and I'm sure you're all aware of it, is the data angle. So yesterday, we heard Google talk about how they use data to help them in, inform their decisions and plan their strategies, and then their execution, of course. And what do you see in terms of a trend throughout the industry with regards to utilizing data to help sort of achieve an omni-market sort of presence, at least where it's important, or do you see it still being very much like I described, which is a tiering sort of thing? I, you get given you must do these languages, and then everything else is just a bit of a fight and see who wins. Okay, um, I'd say it would be optimistic to say that even many major organizations are at the tier level. Uh, as, as we look at what drives uh, language decisions, there's still a lot of even very large companies that are driven by executive preference. So an executive says, hey, I was on vacation in Croatia. I didn't see our products on the shelves. This is a failure. <laughs> and so we've got to, you know, suddenly there's this push to do Croatian, and then you find out that the cost to localize for Croatian exceeded the value of the market. Uh, and we see these kinds of misallocations a lot. Tiering is a step up because then at least typically there's some idea of X number of customers out there we could achieve through it. Um, but we're seeing increasing numbers of organizations that have realized that isn't enough. And some of them actively come to us and say, can you help us develop a data-driven language strategy? Uh, and it ends up being hugely complex. B2C is very different than B2B, and B2B isn't even a monolith. Some B2B looks a lot like B2C, and others doesn't. Um, so, we do a lot of, of work with modeling economic factors to try and drive this, this uh, data-driven approach. And we think this is where everyone has to head. Um, the issue that so many organizations face when they try and do this is they just don't know where to go for the data. Um, this, so they'll go download you know, something like, oh, the internet penetration rate in China is doing this, and so we need to do X. But they may not have considered what are the, the income of the people who have internet. And so there's a huge number of variables that you have to try and combine into a model that means something for your company. And now CSA research where I work has put out some models, but the first thing I have to caution people is it's a combination of art and science. Data will get you to some point, but then you have to know, have in-depth knowledge of, of the market and understand what people want. Uh, but certainly, if you don't have the data, then you're just guessing blindly. Would you say, just to follow on to that point then, is it for an organization out there, for anyone listening who's sort of like, you're right, we're not even at the tiering yet. We do sort of get someone who thinks of something in the shower and the next thing you know, we're in a new market. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's probably more efficient for them to like skip the tiering level and try to achieve a sort of more omni-market using intelligent content, intelligent translation, or go through that? Is it a maturity curve or can they leapfrog? 
I think you can leapfrog it now. Um, you know, there, there's increasingly good sources of data available. Um, the challenge many of them will face, again, comes back to siloing, is a lot of them may want to say, okay, let's, let's assess our effectiveness in existing markets, but they're shut out from the data that uh, the web analytics team may have or that the executives have. And so we'll regularly go and ask companies, can you tell us how many units you're selling in different languages? I have yet to find a company that really has a good handle on this. Sometimes they can tell us how much they're selling in various countries, but most of them, the localization teams don't even have that. And so they're operating in this data deficit. And if that's the case, then tiering does make sense because it's better than nothing. But ideally, they need to push and get executive support to gather the data. And then I just skip the tiering because you're gonna get superior results with data. Excellent. Charles, I wanna jump straight back down to you there because you're in a regulated space where you know, there are obviously differences across regions as well. Like how important is sort of this data question and this you know, maturity curve to you? How, do you guys use a lot of data as you're making these assessments? Yes, certainly data is core to our enterprise for sure. But unlike uh, some of the other comments, we're not as market driven as we are with, with uh, doing the right thing, I guess I'd say, and uh, helping patients, honestly. I think that's, uh, that's the, our most important thing. Got it. And how about Dow? You guys have definitely got a lot of data that you can use to determine where's the next best place to go and do you find yourselves in that, do you have the, let's call it the executive idea model or the tier model or do you think you're probably closer to omni market or at least want to get there? I'd say we're probably closer to the omni market. Of course, it, it really depends on the cycle of where the product is. So our, our data anal analysis starts at the product development aspect and you know, evaluating, okay, what's the product, what's the markets, what are the languages that we're gonna associate there? You know, what's the age of the product and how does that relate to what we've done before? Okay, so then we release it with the specific set of languages. But then we're at a different stage then later on in terms of looking at, you know, what's the support life cycle? Okay, what do we need to do now? Has, has the market changed? Um, you know, has the demand changed and has the audience changed? So we may, do, may need to adjust based upon that as well. Got it, and how about you maybe in VMware? So the data is really important to us, but I think if, depending on what you're look, looking at, it can be really misleading. So for example, um, I look at the number of HTML impressions for our Japanese documentation and they're super low. And yet I know from our sales team that Japan is one of the biggest markets right up there with Germany in terms of the non-English speaking markets. And I finally took a trip to Japan and started asking people about it. Well, almost everything is done through resellers. They're taking our translated content and repackaging some of that for their particular users. And the other thing I learned is that there's a habit of having to, it's a cultural habit, you have to know what you're working on. And so they take, they take a PDF, print it out, and go home and study it for bedtime reading. And so, yeah, there's fewer HTML impressions, but that Japanese content is really, really important to them. And the other thing I wanted to say, we've got the tiering. It's a really important way of not exposing our org chart to the customers because a lot of our products interop. Um, the interoperation is really important. And if they go along and they, they move to a different piece of their workflow and suddenly they're not in Chinese anymore, that's not a good customer experience. So there kind of has to be a baseline. And beyond that, we start to look at the products and the markets. Um, there's some interesting stuff in telco where, for example, Af Africa and um, less developed areas may leapfrog from the type of uh, infrastructure that we have into the telco infrastructure. And so maybe we need to be looking at a different set of languages there, which I find super fascinating. Yeah, and you mentioned, so, well, you have a supply chain in which you have resellers, of course. Um, do you, you probably know about the global content operating model that STL um, proposes, and we work with a lot of customers to implement, where we look at the people processes and technology involved in the creation and delivery of content. And do you find that uh, an operating model like that is absolutely necessary? Or do you find, like, I mean, I came from big organizations and sometimes these things can slow you down. 
right? Or do you think that this is really required to make sure that you just get to that endpoint, keep that customer experience going well, and you're in the markets you need to be in? It's super important to us. So not only for the, the documentation and any other part that we have, that it be connected, um, be seamless, but also even for things as simple as software strings. And when more and more of the content is going into, say, software as a service, to have it right there on a screen, um, all of those strings have to be part of that operating model, too. We need, we need the software connections so that everything is automated. OK. And how mature do you feel with the implementation? Do you think you've You've got it, or there's more to go, or? There's way more to go, because the software's always changing. <laughs> I might know someone who can help. So, no, how about Adele? I mean, do you guys, you probably, I'm sure, got a very, very good, strict, and efficient process going around this. We like to think we do, uh, uh, but I'm sure, you know, there's- Again, I know someone who can help. Yeah, there's, there's <laughs> uh, I think we're talking to them, too. Um, Excellent. So it, 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 it's a key part of what we try to do. Um, and I think it's core of what we do because it also it ensures the quality of what we're trying to accomplish. And, and with being a global organization, if we don't have a model to fall back on, then we're not really going to meet the quality of the products that we have out in the marketplace. So to us, documentation is, is a key asset. Okay? And, and if we don't provide the same level of quality with our documentation as what we do with the products, it's then going to come back on top of us in terms of the service or services and support organization. And so it's going to be additional cost. So having a model like what SDL has proposed uh, is key to us. We continue to evolve that, uh, continue to push that out within our organization, and uh, I think very beneficial. Excellent. And Charles, obviously, yeah. the outcome in your organization, if you get it wrong, is, can be pretty dire. Yeah, I, I think the GCOM label approach, I think it's, I think it's very sound. <clears throat> I heard something yesterday that I thought was kind of profound. <clears throat> you have a GCOM whether you know it or not. And so figuring that out of where it resides, whether it's in your information model, your swim lane diagrams, your process documentation, your style guide, your whatever it is, it exists, but it needs to be treated as, as one thing uh, because we're talking such complex systems and such complex processes nowadays, you really have to uh, make that uh, much more holistic. I think it's uh, very good, very important. Excellent, now coming back to you for that more, stepping back from our individual worlds here, what do you sort of see industry-wide in terms of people applying a disciplined and repeatable process to this? Uh, it's absolutely vital. Um, and the advantage of a model like GCOM, and, and CSA has some similar things uh, that we, we use regularly, is it gives you a way to find weaknesses and try and balance out so that you aren't you don't have one particular function that's actually really advanced but is simply hobbled by something else that isn't. And so when you start looking at the levels that are in there, you can try and balance out and say, here's what we need to improve. And then it allows you to take the organization forward in a way that you don't have the parts working against the whole. And it gives you a lot of strength when you can identify those strengths and weaknesses and say, here's what we need to do to fix this and, and move forward. And it also gives you something aspirational to look forward to as an organization. You'd say, oh, crumb, we're, we're down here. We're level one. Uh, we know that we need to get better. It gives you a roadmap forward, where otherwise you'd be going around saying, I, I don't know what we need to do. Or you'd be hiring uh, Deloitte for you know, hundreds of thousands, not Deloitte, sorry. Um, uh, Omni I'm blanking the name of the company. Uh, Accenture, that's it. Accenture for you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to try and tell you this, when you could go look at what SDL is giving you for free and start building your, your, your model. Right, excellent point, thank you. And um, look, we've talked about the Omni market, we've talked about content challenges, language requirements, GCOM, we've heard about global understanding, intelligent content, intelligent translation. I am definitely giving you a little litany because I want to strike and ask, what is actually your priority, Mimi, and I'll ask the rest of you next. Like when you think about content, you think about going global into new markets, you think about your customer experience, what's really the next big challenge you've got? What are you sort of looking at that's there and you've got to get to it soon? So it's an interesting question for me because we've just done a number of huge acquisitions at VMware and 
I'm looking at integrating these other groups. And so the, the global content operating model is going to be a huge part of that, right, to get them integrated. But I'm also learning that maybe there are reasons that we should leave that separate and take a different approach there. And they're going to be in a different market. And we might need different languages there. So really getting down into the business, the markets, the understanding of each is more important than making everything the same, for now, anyway. Maybe they'll grow up to be all the same. But right. We're so not there yet. In a way, like you have a somewhat omni-market presence then, because they might have different markets they need to be in. And you don't want to break that right. by bringing them in, to yet somehow leverage it, if I'm correct. Yeah, well, definitely. I, did, I didn't mention the leverage part, but that's a really important part when you get to it. If, if they get into that African market first, yep. then maybe they'll follow with the, the rest of it. And I'd personally like to go and, and help them with that. So Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> that's great to hear. Having been through a couple of acquisitions myself, it's great to hear because I've had the other model where it's thou shalt do it our way. Um, and maybe Noel, like what's your... What's the bogey that's on your radar that you've got to tackle straight away? Everyone you mentioned. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, we deal with them at different times between different products. Okay. Uh, so we have to pay attention to them all like, at different times of the day, and uh, one will become more important than the other. But we have to have a focus on each aspect all of the time. Right. Because, um, as, as, as you know, the, the size of the organization and the differences in the products, they all have different nuances. Okay? And the markets that we're trying to apply those to have different requirements as well. So we can't just focus on one of those aspects and expect that's going to apply to our laptops the, ways, the same way it's going to apply to our data center uh, to, uh, products. Now, is this the same when you look at Dell's B2B and B2C sort of market opportunities, do you see? Or do you see a sort of maybe the, uh, the mix changes a little, not in terms of the composition, and contextually, like how you approach it, right? So in B2C, you might approach the translation. I'm not saying you do, yeah. but the, you know, the quality might not be as stringent as it is in B2B, or maybe it is. Like, or do you see, like in B2B and B2C, really you've got the same set of challenges and they all have to be approached with the same level of fervor? Uh, from, from our perspective in the technical content, we try to have um, you know, a set of standards going across. Now, granted, the standards for our enterprise are going to be a little bit different for our client and con consumer areas. So, you know, on the client consumer aspect, you're looking at all the readability aspects that are quite a bit different than what the enterprise aspects are going to be. So, it, again, it's, it's a balancing act that my team has to play with in terms of what we try to do. Got it. Yeah. Balancing act with everything on your shoulders, it has to be done straight away. Uh, yes. Interesting. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And uh, Charles, what about you guys? I mean, do you see sort of something in this progression of like getting to Omni Market, looking at languages and everything is really the key priority you've, you just want to get to as soon as you get home and get <clears throat> tackling? Uh, specific to these items, uh, certainly the, the GCOM is, is most important to us. To get some of these, I'll call them rationalizations, as, as Arlie said, tiering. I would, some of the rationalizations as far as language and, and, and modeling, et cetera, I think it's extremely important for us. Uh, so we've got, a, so we've got a, a clear path through the forest of competing organizational ideologies. Like, and GCOM can help that a lot. All right. So when you think about it in terms of then, sorry, Charles, just to ping on that a little bit, you know, the creation, the translation, and the delivery of content. Of those three, do you feel like there's one area that maybe there's sort of like, you know, you need more? Like everyone always needs more content, but then, of course, the translating more content gets yeah. more expensive and the delivery gets more, and, of course, the management. Like is there a spot there, do you think, at Edwards? Yeah. You've got to focus in a little bit more. Yeah, our, our company, just like everybody else, is just going to have a, a weaker link somewhere along the way, and that's why we call it a tool chain or a process chain because that's exactly what it is. So, yeah, I think it's extraordinarily important to keep that whole chain in, in line uh, from where does this information come from? I mean, it came out of somebody's head, but there's probably some ecosystem related to that, and certainly on the consumption side, there's an ecosystem related to that. So being able to tie that all together is, 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 is worthy of, of time, money, effort. Got it. No, what about you guys? You think in that whole 
I gotta create it, I gotta translate it, and I gotta deliver it. Like, do you think you guys, it's, it's probably gonna be again, they're all just as important, but do you think there's one that really requires a bit of attention right now? You sort of think, obviously Dell has a lot of content across a lot of different products. So you've probably got the creation down. Is it really the translate or is it the, the delivery and management? All of those I think are equal. I, the, I, the challenge I think where we have is really, it's not the volume of what we're trying to get out in terms of the content. It's more the focus on the quality of the content that we're actually delivering and yeah. determining if that volume is the appropriate type of volume or do we need to scale it down and really address the needs and answer the specifics of what the customers are looking for. Got it. And, a, and that's, that's really our challenge. I think we have all the rest of the tool chain kind of defined and well in place. Excellent. All right. And Mimi. So I, we, I think we also have the tool chain in place. So the delivery end of it, we're all fine there. It's really on creating the content there and finding ways to make that scale in the way that we now can make the delivery scale. How do we right. make content creation scale so that subject matter experts can join the writers and get the material out faster, for example, for, for product documentation? Excellent. Um, yeah. And something like GCOM, as you, as you two have built this chain out and you've got it and you've got the delivery down, translation, and then you're effectively going to put more money at the top end of it you feel like GCOM will help you scale it and keep control of it and it's not gonna fragment. That's the idea. Okay, that's the idea. <laughs> yeah. Good, and um, Al, let's finish on a final question. And anyone, if you have some thoughts on this, definitely chime in. But in listening to all of this today and thinking through the research that you guys have done and in terms of priority and what's coming next, like what do you see sort of coming next as a challenge that none of us are actually potentially thinking about or an opportunity that we're going to be able to realize soon. So an example would be, yeah. obviously machine translation didn't always exist, and that was once something we didn't think about, and now it's becoming quite ingrained into all of our processes. Well, there's a couple things that come to mind, and one of them goes back to what Noel said about knowing what the customers need. And that's, uh, as an industry, there's been this uh, center periphery model where you create something, and usually you do, quite a bit of, of in-market research in the U.S. if you're a U.S.-based company. You say, okay, this is what our customers need. But then you don't do the same thing when you go look at what do our customers in India or Indonesia need. And this creates sometimes a gap because they may need something very different than what you're producing. And we're starting to see large enterprises take this seriously and wanting to go out and do the uh, ethnographic research in markets to say, you know, India, they need this kind of training material that you don't see in the US, and Japan, they need this. The issue that we see with this is going to be how do you rein in the costs while still getting this, this uh, intelligence about markets so that you aren't just simply firing off a bunch of content that nobody wants in a particular market. Um, that, that's one of the challenges. Um, the second one, uh, and I'll talk about this in the session I'm doing this afternoon a little bit, is the shift to dialogic or, or conversational content. What do you do if you no longer can assume that you can just simply push things out, but where your customers want to engage right back at you? And in some cases, they may be producing content that you want to bring into the organization and turn out and give to others. I mean, we already see this with like Travelocity or Expedia or TripAdvisor, where a significant portion of their content is simply ingesting content that other people have produced uh, it could be you know, hotels, it could be people who visited, and making this useful to others so that then they go and spend money with them. And this is a challenge a lot of organizations have yet to face because they just think, oh, we're, we generate content for others. But often they desperately need to be able to ingest this content, understand the intent, and deal with this. And it's great except that the technologies that do this pretty much are limited to English right now. So the moment you start trying to ingest content in Swahili, forget it. You, you, you don't have a way to access and really know it. And you can use machine translation, but it's not a, a perfect solution. And this is almost a moonshot sort of thing for uh, the natural language processing uh, community to try and address. Got it. Thank you. Any comments from the panelists at all? Or? Any thoughts on what you might see as something potentially moonshot-like coming on the horizon? 
I mean, you've obviously heard SDL's point of view on this with the Dolphos keynote yesterday with the Intelligent Content Hub and things like that. Mimi, I think you were going to say something. I, I was just thinking about some of what Arl said and um, <clears throat> having worked with the team that's putting together a bot to try to make that work. And I'm the, I'm the voice of the localization team always saying, well, how are you going to do this for our other languages? What's, what's next? And I think at there, there's a point at which we look at how we get that natural language processing mm. engine from some company out there that's working in Swahili or wherever it is um, and, and put that together for our any customers that we may have that need it. But I think that's, that is a tremendous future of booking area. Excellent. Yeah, and we, we were talking backstage about the bots and the conversational aspects of, of content and how great that would be to have that in place. Uh, but then the realities kind of set in to, you know, to support that is, is quite challenging, especially when you start to try and localize that and you have multiple systems trying to do the same thing and keeping those in sync. Yes. And then you're looking at, okay, is, is the cost and is the return there to support that concept? So I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think we're hoping for that magic bullet to show up that we'll be able to apply to our content with all of the intelligence there and all our customers will get all the answers that they want. In conversational form. Exactly. Yeah. Charles. Cer certainly <clears throat> automation is extraordinarily important. It continues. Over my career, I still can hardly believe the level of automation we're, we're at and where we're going uh, with artificial intelligence, as we call it but also being able to use this advanced automation to a point where we can reconstruct what actually happened rather than just say it went into a black box and it came out the other side. So proving that and repeatability of exactly how that happened through an AI engine is, is going to be very important for, for us in particular, I think. Excellent. Well, with that, I'd like to wrap up and I'd like to thank you very much for your time and being here today and everyone for their attention. And I would ask that you all stick around because as we exit, Betsy will come back and actually give us stuff away.